Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I hope that you all enjoyed your break. I will give our attendees just a second to come out of the waiting room onto our session. Again, my name is Jamie Singletary, and I am the Director of Clinical Brand Development for Within Health, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to day three of our 2024 Within Health Summit. I am joined this afternoon by Dr. Caitlin Shepard and Dr. Rebecca Boswell, who I will introduce in just a moment. Also, just a few housekeeping. I will have my email in the chat along with the CEGO contact information. Should you have any technical issues or questions about your certificate, I will have that contact information there so that you can reach out to either myself or CEGO directly, keeping in mind that you will only receive credit if you are watching the presentation. You will not get credit for going back and watching the recording of the presentation. You do have to watch live. So if you need to change the devices for any reason, just please let me know and I will make sure that you get your credit. So without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers. I'll start with Dr. Caitlin Shepard. She is the Clinical Research Director at Within Health. As a licensed psychologist and research affiliate at Smith College, she has over a decade of experience in the eating disorder field. She earned both her MS and PhD in counseling psychology from Colorado State University and then completed advanced clinical and research training in the eating disorder program at Well Cornell Medical College. New York Presbyterian Hospital. She has extensive experience treating individuals with eating disorders and other mental health concerns in a variety of settings across levels of care. She has also held faculty positions at several institutions, including Wesleyan University and Smith College, where she taught clinical excuse me, in research-oriented courses in managed and eating disorder research lab. As a researcher, she has published articles in peer-reviewed journals and presented at numerous regional, national, and international conferences. She is an active member of the Academy of Eating Disorders, currently serving as a co-chair for the Educational Programming Committee. Dr. Rebecca Boswell is the supervising psychologist at the Princeton Center for Eating Disorders, where she provides clinical supervision and engages in research and program development on the unit. She is a lecturer at Princeton University and completed her clinical psychology training at Yale University, the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, and the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Boswell serves as an external research consultant to Within Health. It is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Shepard and Dr. Boswell. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Jamie. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides here to get us going. Here we are. Uh, so as Jamie said, we'll be talking today about tailoring eating disorder assessments, uh, inclusive strategies for diverse populations. And I'm delighted to be uh, here today with my co-presenter, Dr. Rebecca Boswell, um, to talk about this topic. Um, at last year's summit, for those of you that, that uh, were here, um, I shared about Within's uh, commitment to measurement-based care and how this evidence-based approach can optimize outcomes in eating disorder treatment. So this year, we're building on that foundation by examining the limitations of some traditional assessment tools, uh, which often overlook the unique experiences and identities of individuals and can ultimately perpetuate health disparities and harm. Um, and in line with uh, this year's summit theme, our presentation today will explore potential biases in eating disorder assessments uh, with a particular emphasis on body inclusivity. So addressing factors such as weight status, racial and ethnic identity, and gender identity. Um, since we only have 90 minutes, uh, the pr this presentation will provide a, an illustrative overview rather than exhaustive one. Um, certainly this topic uh, could easily warrant a much longer, more in-depth training uh, covering additional assessment tools, identities, and techniques. Uh, but our goal for today is to uh, equip you with some practical strategies and some important information um, that can hopefully ultimately enhance the effectiveness of eating disorder assessments um, while trying to promote uh, a more inclusive and compassionate approach to, to care. 
Uh, so with that in mind, um, you'll see our agenda here. So we'll um, finish up, wrap up this introduction, um, and then move into the content for the presentation. Um, so starting with talking about um, how assessments can potentially perpetuate um, misconceptions about eating disorders and stereotypes, um, thus exacerbating inequities and potentially contributing to harm. Uh, we'll then uh, get into the challenges of inclusive clinical diagnostic um, uh, clinical and diagnostic interviewing. So focusing on highlighting strategies to address these issues, uh, using the eating disorder examination as an example. Um, and next we'll explore the benefits and limitations of patient reported outcome measures uh, using the eating disorder examination questionnaire as an example, uh, reviewing some of the research on uh, inclusivity gaps and offering recommendations for use and modifications. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll wrap up with some uh, ideas for additional tools uh, to consider key takeaways and hopefully have some time at the end for some questions um, as well. Uh, so I know uh, Jamie already provided um, wonderful introductions uh, for us, but just a little bit about me again. Uh, I'm a licensed psychologist um, with over a decade of experience in the eating disorder field. Um, as the clinical research director here at Within Health, um, I oversee our clinical research and outcomes program. So that includes um, using current assessment literature to inform uh, inclusive measurement tool selection, modification, and recommendations for interpretation uh, to support our clinical team in utilizing measurement-based care, in addition to then also um, running our, our uh, research program. Uh, while I'm not currently uh, practicing clinically, uh, certainly my prior clinical experience um, factors into the work that I do now, uh, really underscoring the importance of personalized, um, compassionate approaches to eating disorder assessment. Um, and so certainly you'll, you'll hear about that throughout the presentation today. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm, as I said, pleased to be joined by Dr. Rebecca Boswell, and we'll let her go ahead and um, introduce herself now. Thanks so much, Dr. Shepard, and I am uh, really excited to be part of this uh, presentation today. Uh, you know, I, um, as Jamie mentioned, I'm a research consultant for Within, and so have been, you know, involved with Dr. Shepard's fantastic work in working through patient-reported measures as part of the design of their programming. Um, I'm also the director, so no longer the supervising psychologist, uh, of the Princeton Center for Eating Disorders, um, which uh, is, you know, a a clinical setting with uh, research and uh, ongoing teaching involved at uh, the center. And so, you know, I hope to bring a perspective of, you know, both clinical and research minded ways to think through uh, inclusive assessment methods. And uh, something that I, you know, also wanted to mention as uh, Dr. Shepard and I introduced ourselves is that you know, with this topic of inclusive assessment, um, we are also mindful of our positionality in approaching this question that, you know, in striving for inclusivity for diverse and historically marginalized groups, we both acknowledge uh, that, you know, our positionality as cisgender white women might limit our perspectives on what inclusive assessment tools, uh, how they can be adapted and how we can develop new tools that can really, you know, uh, honor and emphasize the voices of folks that have been historically marginalized by the field. And, you know, we aimed this presentation to talk about the current tools that exist, the, all of their limitations, and then ways that we can use those tools in ways that reduce potential harm to, you know, the patients that we serve. And so uh, are mindful of how our positionality might create blind spots and are, you know, really wanting to do our best to move the field towards um, more inclusive assessment uh, in a much grander scale in the future. Absolutely. And I'll just, um, I appreciate um, Dr. Boswell's uh, point here and just sort of echo that, that, um, you know, approaching this talk, you know, we're bringing our clinical and research um, backgrounds and kind of talking from that viewpoint um, and, you know, are very much in the process of still doing this work and learning ourselves and, you know, are very much open to, you know, additional information and, and you know, comments um, about how to continue to improve. So, that's certainly a big part of, of um, the work here is, you know, yes, sort of looking at what we know, but there's so much that is still 
not known about how to really do this work well. Uh, so with that, we do have some learning objectives and um, some things that we do hope that you're able to take from this talk today. Um, again, recognizing that, you know, certainly this could be a much larger, uh, bigger conversation. Um, so as we cover these uh, different topic areas, um, we will focus on helping you hopefully meet these outlined learning objectives. So um, we'll start with um, explaining how stereotypes and biases in eating disorder assessment uh, contribute to health disparities and potential harm to patients. Um, we hope that you'll be able to identify um, a few, three challenges um, in traditional clinical and diagnostic interviewing uh, related to cultural weight, um, body size, um, and gender factors. Uh, be able to demonstrate associated, associated adaptations across relevant eating disorder uh, clinical interview constructs that will be discussed. Um, evaluate the limitations of traditional patient reported outcome measures. Um, and then apply um, at least two practical strategies for selecting and or uh, adapting some existing tools um, to enhance accessibility and relevance. Uh, so we've got a lot to cover within that. So we'll go ahead and dive right into uh, the first piece around the importance of inclusive assessment. Uh, so I'm sure this is not uh, new information for, for most, if not all of you here today, um, but there's you know this common misconception about eating disorders uh, known as the SWAG stereotype, uh, which, which suggests that only skinny, white, affluent girls uh, experience these conditions. Uh, this is a longstanding myth that dates back decades, uh, can be traced to some early works on anorexia that primarily focused on this very limited demographic uh, resulting in uh, the definition of the illness as a disease of affluence, um, thought to only affect those who are raised in privileged circumstances. Um, so despite uh, some progress in recognizing the diversity of individuals affected by eating disorders, um, thanks to many uh, advocates, researchers, clinicians, those with lived experience um, who have really amplified uh, the voices of, of marginalized populations, the stereotype um, still persists in many ways today. Um, we see this limited narrative uh, reflected in media portrayals and other places that really reinforces the idea that individuals outside this narrow definition um, do not develop eating disorders and do not need help. Uh, certainly such representations oversimplify the issue um, and have significant implications for diagnosis, prevention, and treatment. Um, ultimately leading to gaps in care within our, our healthcare systems. Uh, so of course, we know and research shows that this swag stereotype is not true. Uh, not only do eating disorders affect individuals across cultures and identities, uh, but data show that, um, that some marginalized groups experience actually heightened risk for eating disorders. Uh, so just some different statistics, for instance, regarding racial and ethnic diversity or identity. Uh, studies suggest that approximately 20 to 26% of individuals with eating disorders identify as BIPOC. Um, there's some research pointing to certain eating disorders like bulimia nervosa being more common in um, certain populations, so black and Latino populations uh, compared to non-Latino white. Uh, in terms of gender identity, statistics show that approximately one uh, in four individuals with eating disorders are men or boys. Uh, there's also some research indicating that transgender individuals uh, may display higher levels of eating disorder symptoms than their cisgender peers. Um, and as for weight status, there is evidence that disordered eating risk increases with, with weight or BMI, um, and that the prevalence of um, uh, atypical anorexia nervosa, which uh, occurs at higher weights, is at least as common, if not more so, than low weight uh, anorexia nervosa. Um, so while we focus on race, ethnicity, gender, and weight status in this presentation, um, certainly it's important to acknowledge that eating disorders impact individuals across other aspects of culture and identity, including socioeconomic status, as is uh, incorporated into that uh, original stereotype. Um, and there are additional stereotypes and misconceptions influencing who may be overlooked. 
Um, furthermore, uh, while much of the research presented here and much of the research, honestly, that has been done um, examines identities in isolation, uh, certainly considering multiple in intersecting identities often reveals um, an even greater risk or different type of risk um, in terms of eating disorders, um, really underscoring the need to move beyond these narrow stereotypes. Um, and those misconceptions and stereotypes surrounding eating disorders um, have significant consequences um, within in many places, but certainly within healthcare systems. Um, so it can lead to under recognition, under screening and under diagnosis and under referral to treatment. Uh, many individuals may not recognize um, their own eating disorder symptoms, uh, perhaps because they feel like they don't fit uh, that stereotypical mold. Um, and then this is supported by some research showing that help-seeking rates are notably lower among men and ethnic or racial minorities. Uh, stereotypes can also influence providers who may unconsciously avoid screening individuals, um, for example, who don't match their beliefs about who develops an eating disorder. Uh, for example, we see that BIPOC individuals with eating disorders are 50% less likely to receive a diagnosis or treatment compared to their white counterparts. Um, additionally, while atypical anorexia nervosa, again, appears to be more common than anorexia nervosa with low, uh, at low weights, um, patients with atypical anorexia are less frequently referred to or admitted into eating disorder specific care. Um, so bias in eating disorder assessment is one of many factors that can contribute to these uh, disparities. Um, these tools uh, often define eating disorder behaviors and body image concerns through stereotypical lenses. So they may be overlooking the experiences of uh, marginalized populations. Um, and then these biases can not only exacerbate existing inequities, um, but also even create new ones by disproportionately benefiting those who fit uh, the stereotype while leaving others at risk. Uh, so the enactment of these misconceptions, um, including through biases in eating disorder assessment, can also result in direct harm to patients. Uh, so first of all, uh, as an example, gaps in eating disorder assessment often obscure the need for culturally attuned and contextually relevant interventions. So by not accurately reflecting the diverse experiences of marginalized groups, uh, these gaps conceal critical differences that might exist in treatment needs. Um, which you know, could otherwise lead to more effective tailored interventions. Uh, moreover, we know that many of these tools uh, pathologize patients um, and can even um, inflict trauma. For example, questions asking about feeling fat uh, reinforce uh, anti-fat attitudes and validate societal biases favoring thinness. Um, and certainly being exposed to this language can you know, deepen shame, um, which is particularly harmful for individuals who are already impacted by a world that stigmatizes and devalues larger bodies. Um, and additionally, these stereotypes can result um, in damaging treatment recommendations. For instance, providers recommending weight loss for higher weight patients um, who have eating disorders. Uh, this kind of advice is often contradictory to the goals of eating disorder treatment um, and again, may perpetuate um, disordered eating behavior. So really deepening those struggles and, and perpetuating harm rather than, than helping. Um, so for patients whose experiences aren't captured by traditional assessment tools, um, who feel stigmatized by the language used in assessments, the process of seeking help can ultimately be re-traumatizing and invalidating. So addressing these negative impacts um, necessitates uh, an examination of our assessment practices so that we can try to work towards being inclusive and truly reflective of diverse populations that we serve uh, to the extent possible. And as Dr. Boswell said previously, try to work to reduce harm within those systems. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Boswell to uh, discuss some of the challenges and solutions then for uh, inclusive uh, clinical and diagnostic interviewing. Thanks, Dr. Shepard. Yeah, so that was a really fantastic overview of the, the problem that we see when it comes to inclusivity and in eating disorder care. And assessment, a lot of times, is one of our you know, uh, barriers to entry to get access to care, which makes it especially important to be able to you know, know about how to adapt assessment um, 
to address different groups and get them good and equitable access. Um, when we do look at standard eating disorder assessments, there really is substantial variability in how different population groups respond to standard questions. And so that's something that is regularly seen when it comes to variation across racial and ethnic groups and genders, uh, specifically in you know, the types of behaviors that they tend to report, whether that's restriction, binge eating and purging, and the way that they endorse uh, standard questions around body image concerns. For example, when it comes to body image assessment, some of the research suggests that uh, white, Black, and Latina women show different relationships between body image constructs and psychopathology. So for example, if we think about you know, the ways in which typical eating disorder um, psychopathology models tend to think about body image. These groups are showing different relationships between exposure to media, thin ideals, body dissatisfaction, and dietary restraint, really suggesting that our early models about body image and even eating disorder psychopathology might not fit all groups in the same way. Uh, which of course then begs the question of what we're assessing and whether it is uh, interpreted the same way across groups. And so uh, there's a metric called measurement invariance that tries to look at whether when we measure the same construct, it's interpreted in the same way across different groups. And what we've seen in some research is that there is some measurement invariance between groups, um, but some measures don't have that <laughs> measurement invariant. So it's really a mixed bag. Uh, for example, there was this one study that had a pretty large sample finding a variety of metrics around sameness of concepts between black and white women when it comes to eating disorder self-report scales, really suggesting that if we use a one size fits all approach to eating disorder assessment, we will inevitably be seeing differences across groups and perhaps missing or underrepresenting the severity of what folks are experiencing and hopefully not, but potentially reducing access to specialized eating disorder care. That's the next slide, Dr. Shepard, if you don't mind. Thank you. So I'll talk a little bit first about traditional clinical interviewing practices. Um, and what you know the standard assessments tend to look like. And then we'll spend some time doing an overview of ways to adapt the assessments that we currently have in order to potentially address some of these uh, natural biases in the way these metrics and concepts have been defined historically. When we think about traditional clinical settings, for the most part, folks are engaging in unstructured interviews. Uh, that may be guided by clinical diagnostic criteria, so guided by DSM criteria around whether someone meets behavioral and cognitive criteria for an eating disorder, as well as an interviewer's clinical judgment about potential uh, precipitating and maintaining factors for an eating disorder to get an open conce a conceptualization of what a patient is experiencing. And there's no specific guidance on how an unstructured interview would take place. I think folks tend to have different stylistic approaches to that, but typically it's a, a mix of closed. So do you experience this? Yes or no. And open questions. Can you tell me about this experience? Um, and because unstructured interviews are so varied across setting and across type, uh, both clinical and research approaches have tried to create something that's a little bit more structured, somewhere in between, um, you know, something that varies based on style and uh, is a little bit less uh, black and white than a patient-reported survey metric. Um, one of the benefits of the unstructured interviews is that it allows for a lot of clinical nuance, a lot of uh, rapport building, and can really allow you know, the art of interviewing to take place. Um, however, that also comes with a hidden possibility of creating space for bias to you know, inform who gets asked which questions and how that gets implemented. So semi-structured interviews are sort of that middle space in between. And uh, really one of the gold standard interviews for eating disorders is the eating disorder examination interview, which was developed to have, you know, some more fine grain detail compared to self-report, but a little more structure than an unstructured interview. 
Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the EDE, uh, the way it works is that there is an initial question that is scripted. It's sort of the verbatim text that can be followed with or pr prompted before with additional clarifying questions or content. Um, the concepts are really explained in the same way to try and have you know standard assessment across people. And then ultimately the interviewer rates, sometimes on a scale of zero to five, sometimes zero to seven. And the rating that the interviewer provides can override patient reports based on other information, like the interviewer's judgment, whether a patient is not able to accurately represent the severity of their illness and other factors. Um, and there aren't open questions, right? So it's uh, structured in a way that there um, are prompts around frequency or severity as the, the content that's supposed to be provided um, in the standard prompt text. That doesn't mean that there can't be open questions, just means that it's not a standard part of the way the structured interview is designed. Uh, the way that the examination sort of works out psychometrically is that it ends up having four subscales, which are averages of responses measuring a particular concept. And so the concepts that are defined by the EDE include restraint, eating concern, weight concern, and shape concern. So some of the questions that go into that concept of restraint are things like, have you been deliberately trying to limit the amount of food you eat to influence your shape or your weight, whether or not you succeeded? And it's that same question text every time, no matter who the person is or what the context is. For eating concern, an example question would be, has thinking about food, eating, or calories made it very difficult to concentrate on things that you are interested in? For example, working, following a conversation, or reading. So same question, same examples, every single person. For weight concern, one of the example questions is, have you had a strong desire to lose weight? And for a shape concern, two of the questions are, uh, have you, has your shape influenced how you think about or judge yourself as a person? And uh, the question, have you had the feeling of being fat? Um, so those are some of the examples of the verbatim text. And I'll talk a little bit more about ways to navigate through that text when we're engaging in assessment. Um, in addition to these four subscales, the eating disorder examination includes behavioral frequencies. So estimates of frequency of binge eating or purging or severity of restrictive eating. Um, because the EDE has these ratings that the interviewer provides, the scores are distributed on a, on a curve, like all psychometric responses, just like patient reported measures that are self-report in their entirety. And individual responses are compared to norms for different populations, for example, people with and without disordered eating. But the norms that have been developed are really not developed for all diverse groups, and typically the samples that have uh, contributed to norm development tend to be really um, homogenous and not representative of the number of folks that do experience eating disorders across diverse groups, um, which is one of the problems with these tools and assessments because, uh, you know, the comparison is a comparison that can sometimes feel like apples to oranges. So to illustrate a little bit about that, I'll talk about where those norms are developed for this assessment and how that problem sort of plays into what this measure ends up meaning for people. So uh, the eating disorder examination was developed in the United Kingdom. And so these are the sort of digging through the archive studies that led to its you know, initial development and use. And so the original reliability and validity study samples um, started first with Cooper and Fairburn in 1987. The initial sample was 12 women with no race or ethnicity speci specified, but it was in the UK. And they indicated that it was a normal, whatever that is, or low BMI sample. Um, their follow-up study was with samples in the UK and in Toronto, a larger sample of 100 women, mean age of 20. Again, this normal or low BMI sample without... Um, you know, gender, race, or ethnicity really specified, and the match controls uh, folks were women. Uh, so again, you know, a really specific group. In Rose in 1990, uh, there was an 18 to 22 year old female sample in Vermont, USA, without race or ethnicity specified. And then there was a norm study in 1994 looking at young women 18 to 35 in the UK. And so I think we can, you know, 
based on what was reported in these studies, the reporting requirements for, you know, demographics were quite different uh, a couple decades ago. And so based on what's reported, I think we can safely assume that a lot of these samples seem to fit that swag stereotype that Dr. Shepard talked about previously. And, you know, these are still the papers that end up creating the norms for the EDE and by extension, the EDEQ. Um, and so that's one of the, you know, problems with this metric is that, you know, it's not really extensively validated in diverse populations. Um, and that, per that perhaps can explain, you know, why different groups tend to report different relationships with some of these variables. Uh, that being said, the EGE still allows for some interviewer flexibility and creativity in tailoring questions and follow-up prompts. Uh, so the, although formal adaptations for diverse populations have not been established, there are some clinical tools that we can use to try and have as much accuracy of these assessments as possible for diverse groups, and at the very least, minimize the harm of some of the assumptions of these questions that were developed in you know, these uh, really restricted samples. So there are some you know, substantial challenges that can come with inclusive interviewing. Um, and I sort of I wanna highlight two different major processes that I think we would really recommend when it comes to inclusive interviewing from a clinical perspective um, to sort of inform all of our work moving forward. First is really thinking about the power dynamics of interviewing in and of itself. So really asking ourselves the question of why is someone being interviewed in this way? What brought someone to a situation where you know, they are meeting with a professional to, you know, talk about really, you know, painful, personal, difficult problems with their physical and mental health. And what are the kinds of emotions and, you know, thinking patterns they might have just walking into a room to be assessed um, and really trying to hold space for, you know, how difficult it is to be in a place often with a stranger or someone you've barely known and bear your soul to some really difficult uh, questions that can be very painful to answer and to hear. Uh, it can also be very difficult to be interviewed by a healthcare professional. So, you know, healthcare professionals and healthcare in general is experienced very different by folks from different communities. There are historical uh, experiences of systematic discrimination when it comes to healthcare access. And they're not just histories, they're real present experiences that, you know, folks continue to be marginalized and experience bias in their day to day um, for a whole host of reasons that, you know, can be related to identity and to systematic problems within the healthcare profession. And so I think there's a real opportunity when we think about wanting to be inclusive and in interviewing our patients to hold that close to our minds and to our hearts when we're asking someone to be very vulnerable in a setting that can be very difficult to be vulnerable in. And to compound upon that, you know, it's important to think about what the identities of the interviewer are and how they might compare to the person being interviewed and contribute to that power dynamic, sitting in a healthcare setting, potentially with someone of a different racial, ethnic, de gender, body size experience, and how that might be to be asked to answer vulnerable making questions um, in a setting that can be foreign or even feel hostile. Um, and as interviewers, I think of it as, you know, in many ways, our obligation to be humble about that power dynamic and acknowledge it explicitly and try and create as safe and equitable of a space within our dynamics with patients as possible. Um, and one of the ways to do that is to be aware, be mindful and be explicit about some of these dynamics that go into every clinical interaction, especially something as in-depth as a clinical interview. Um, in addition, I mean, I think that the second tool that we can really think about when it comes to inclusive interviewing is trying to understand that relevant constructs that are part of eating disorder psychopathology are very much likely different across different groups of people, different cultures, and different body sizes. 
And so uh, one of the concepts that really um, jumped out to myself and to Dr. Shepard when we looked at the EDE and the EDEQ closely is like Dr. Shepard mentioned that concept of feeling fat, right? Like what does that mean across cultures and body sizes? How do we talk about fatness in interviews related to eating psychopathology? And uh, how do we do that in a mindful and thoughtful way that can acknowledge weight bias and discrimination and different ideas about bodies across cultures? Likewise, this concept of fear of weight gain might be different, right? So what is the what is the dynamic of that fear? Uh, it's really, you know, something that can have a lot of nuance to it that I think, you know, historically in developing these interviews um, was defined in one single way. And then, you know, there's a, a whole part of this assessment that's focused on discomfort with yourself and others seeing one's body, which is a very culturally informed concept and would naturally have differences across cultures. Um, so, you know, being mindful of what we're assessing and how those constructs might vary across groups can be a major asset when we're trying to create more inclusive and tailored in interviews for our patients. So one of those strategies for inclusive interviewing is building rapport and trust with our patients uh, in acknowledgement of those power dynamics. So, you know, sometimes when we think about doing a clinical interview, it's like, okay, we're booking that hour, we're going to get through all the questions and then figure the rest of it out later, sort of like becomes a task on a checklist. But that is, uh, you know, a sure way to miss a lot of the nuance and beauty of an assessment interaction. Really, we can intentionally make every assessment a clinical interaction, right? Well, that we can still use all of our validation, warmth, and kindness while we're trying to understand the nuances about someone's experience and about their eating disorder psychopathology. And uh, part of that, uh, something that really does, I think, build rapport and trust is, is acknowledging the interview context and the limitations of the measures that we use. So some examples of some wording that might help to do that include saying to someone that shows up in your office, you know, if you have this semi-structured interview uh, ready to administer, to say, you know, I'm going to ask you so many questions today about your eating, which can be a very difficult thing to talk about, especially with a new person. And I am so grateful for your willingness to talk about th this with me today. Um, so really validating the difficulty of sharing and expressing appreciation, warmth, kindness for that vulnerability, and even acknowledging limitations of the measures. So for example, saying, I'm going to use the exact interview wording that's been tested in research, but some of these questions might really not entirely reflect your experience. And if something is unclear, or doesn't seem to fit or is a little confusing, please let me know so I can help clarify and make sure that I'm really getting to know your experience. Another strategy for building rapport and trust is acknowledging identities and encouraging open discussion of how identity might impact interview responses. And so if there's an opportunity to talk about uh, inclusivity, right, saying things like, you know, sometimes people think that eating problems might only affect thin white cisgender women, and we know that's not the case right, like is a really validating, impactful statement and encourages more uh, discussion about identity and identity related conceptualizations. Another example or some text that we can think about is saying, you know, some of these questions might ask about eating our bodies in a way that's different or more nuanced and people who aren't thin, white, cisgender women. So if we notice that, let's please plan on talking about it so I can learn more about what your individual experiences are. Right, so acknowledging the limitations of measures that they might be designed for a different target group and still validating that the patient that's with you in that moment, their experience matters most to you. And, uh, you know, our final strategy, and this is a nuanced one, is trying to consider questions that are part of interviews that may have identity related impact and use prefaces and follow up questions to address those identity related impacts directly. So for example, uh, you know, Dr. Shepard and I talked about this feeling of fatness question. So um, that question for some people might immediately make sense just at face value, but 
for folks who have experienced significant weight bias or who, um, you know, are still working through their internalized weight bias, like many of our patients are, it can be um, difficult to actually specify what that means. And it could have a harmful impact to be in a clinical assessment room with an interviewer that's using a word that has been used perhaps in painful ways for them in the past, or that might not feel neutral to them in the way that it feels neutral to the interviewer. So for example, two ways to sort of set up a preface or a caveat around something like this could say, you know, heads up, the next question uses the word fat. And sometimes this is a word that people regularly use in a neutral way. And other times it's used in a really unfortunate and negative way. How do you typically use this word, right? So that you're not assuming uh, someone's relationship with the word fat and are not using it in a sort of quick, fast assessment based way. Another example of some ways to talk about that would be giving people a heads up. So I'm going to read the next question. There is some language in it that can make some people feel uncomfortable, especially if that word has been used to put them down in the past. And I'm very sorry if this impacts you. It's really meant this word to uh, explain a concept. And so I'll work with you to sort of explain what the concept is and why we're trying to understand about this concept. Um, and then in a semi-structured interview, you read the words as they're written. So you would say on how many of the past 28 days have you felt that um, and have a patient's initial response and then work on some of the clarifying questions on the next slide. Uh, so for example, um, if someone's like, I don't really know what you mean by that, that doesn't quite fit my experience. So we might clarify that concept by saying, you know, what this question is trying to measure is not what someone's body size is, or not what their experience with the word fatness is, but a feeling that some people describe when they feel badly about themselves and they label it as feeling fat. Sometimes it can be something that's uh, related to meaning that someone's feeling self-conscious or self-critical, but this measures about the extent to which an individual person interprets those self-conscious or self-critical feelings as feeling fat and not something else. So is that feeling fat a construct that you've heard about from someone or seen in media? Sometimes it's something we've seen in the Bridget Jones diary or some other random television show or movie. Or would you describe this kind of feeling in some other way that sort of more fits your experience? So really trying to articulate what was intended in the interview and not just using the standard question text uh, in a way that doesn't have the additional cushioning padding explanation um, to prevent harm from, you know, having a patient uh, experience sort of that shock of having someone that they're trusting with their, you know, vulnerable thoughts about their bodies and their eating uh, use a word that, you know, is complicated for many people. Another example is this question, right, of how that's sort of verbatim in the EDE uh, interview which is on how many of the past 28 days have you had a definite fear that you might gain weight? Um, and some people, you know, might not really interpret that question in the same way, depending on what their identities are and what their bodies have been like and what their eating patterns have been like in the past, you know, three months or so, right? And so to clarify this concept and to be more inclusive about what this concept of fear of weight gain might be, I have two follow-up questions that can potentially help clarify. One is to say, you know, what the concept is measuring. So what this question is measuring is a definite fear, like how some people are scared of spiders. That's sometimes different than worry, like, if, and worry would be like if there's a spider somewhere in your future. So trying to catch, capture that fear piece of it um, in a different way than how other folks might interpret it. Um, and then the second piece of it would be um, the second uh, prompt could be this question is saying is only measuring fear about weight increasing, not fear or worry about being at a high weight or not losing weight. It's fear of the number going up, not your shape or your health changing. Do you have any of these fears? Could you please tell me about those fears that you might have around weight? Um, to use open questions and trying to understand someone's relationship with that question without you know, moving along without understanding really where someone is coming from. So this is a third concept that also can have, you know, real 
identity related impact. That's good to clarify. So what one of the questions on the EDE is during the past 28 days, how uncomfortable have you felt seeing your body? For example, seeing your shape in a mirror in a shop window reflection while undressing or while taking a bath or shower. And so uh, for example, uh, this can be really complicated when folks have body image distress related to more than just body size or body shape when it comes to eating psychopathology. So for example, um, sometimes folks who are gender diverse often report both gender related and eating related body image distress. And so for example, to, cuff, to follow up and clarify a little bit, we might add for a prompt for those folks to say, you know, this is a really tough one to answer. And this is asking about or how uncomfortable have you felt seeing your body specifically because of its size and not related to gender? Can we think together about how much of your initial answer was related to gender and how much is related to body size and shape in general? Uh, and that for people can be like an impossible task, right? They could be exactly overlapping. The Venn diagram could be a circle or it could be a bit more nuanced, right? And that's one of the conversations that a semi-structured interview can help to help have, right? To help people understand different ways that body image is expressed in different groups. Um, another sort of prompt here is around just what it's like to have people see bodies, right? That that can really vary across cultures. And so one of the clarifying questions could be, how uncomfortable have you felt seeing your body specifically because of your body shape and size and not because of modesty or rules around who's allowed to see your body? And are there any other reasons you might be uncomfortable seeing your body? Sorry, folks, just trying to get my camera back on. Uh, thank you, Dr. Boswell. Welcome um, back, Dr. Shepard. Thank you. <laughs> I am here. Um, so having heard about uh, some of those challenges and strategies for inclusive clinical and diagnostic interviewing, uh, we can move into talking about uh, what this looks like for patient-reported outcome measures as well. And you'll certainly hear um, some similar concepts and, and a lot of overlap um, in terms of uh, patient report outcome measures and uh, what Dr. Boswell mentioned um, with uh, interviews and in particular the EDE. Oops, go back. Uh, so uh, the use of patient reported outcome measures or PROMS uh, for short uh, throughout treatment is uh, increasingly recognized as a recommended practice and in, in some cases um, even an expected component of care you know, by accrediting bodies or payers or um, other stakeholders. Um, so patient reported outcome measures, um, if you're not familiar with that term, are defined as measurements of a patient's health, right, that are provided directly by the patient via self-report rather than something that is being um, stated to and then potentially interpreted by a provider. Um, so these then offer a structured way for individuals to convey their experiences, um, and when used effectively, um, ideally within a, a collaborative measurement-based care framework that uh, enables some of the same kinds of conversations that Dr. Boswell just talked about with interviews, um, it can offer, they can offer a number of benefits. Um, so it's just kind of generally speaking in terms of uh, PROMS, um, they can promote, again, within that kind of context, um, active patient involvement. So encouraging individuals to report their personal experiences and concerns. Um, this process can enhance engagement in therapy, uh, can foster self a greater self-awareness and reflection, um, encourage honesty, allow patients to bring up some of those sensitive topics in a structured way, um, can help facilitate goal setting and, and really make the therapeutic process um, more empowering and collaborative. Um, Additionally, PROMS can help providers uh, focus session content, so by allowing them to tailor discussions and interventions uh, based on the patient's reported needs and progress. Um, they can facilitate prioritization of patient concerns, so ensuring that the issues that are perhaps most important to the patient aren't overlooked, um, and can also highlight areas where patients are doing well, um, allowing providers to direct attention to uh, the most relevant priorities. Um, can provide structure to sessions, improving efficiency, helping patients feel more prepared, um, which can further in enhance the therapeutic experience. Um, third, incorporating PROMS 
can improve the overall quality of care. So by offering uh, valuable insights that inform treatment decisions and support a more individualized approach, um, can aid in diagnosis, so can assist providers in tailoring care based on specific patient reported concerns and symptoms. Um, can also prompt appropriate um, and timely uh, action, um, allowing providers to uh, more effectively and quickly address patients' unique needs. Um, uh, fourth, uh, they stand, can help standardize monitoring of patient progress over time, which is one of the, the, the big ways that we see them uh, really being sort of leveraged. Um, so it makes it easier to consistently track changes and outcomes, um, helps providers sort of monitor effectiveness of treatment, identify you know, when someone is struggling, allowing for adjustments um, as needed and, and supporting that continuous data-driven care. Um, and lastly, um, using PROMS, again, especially within a collaborative um, framework, uh, can enhance working relationships uh, between patients and providers. So fostering some of that open communication and trust um, that Dr. Boswell was talking about as well. Um, so taking the time to review and discuss PROM data um, can really demonstrate uh, that providers genuinely care about their patients' well-being. And so it can really uh, also re reassure patients that they're being taken seriously and that their concerns matter. So helping them feel supported and not alone in treatment. So certainly a number of benefits that can be derived from using these types of measures. Now, that being said, certainly they're also not without limitations. So while um, they can offer many advantages, especially when, um, as I said, used within certain um, types of frameworks, uh, they also come with certain kind of general limitations um, as well as specific ones that we'll get into. Uh, so first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that um, by and large, these types of tools are generally designed for broad populations um, with the goal of uh, aggregating outcomes data for research or evaluation purposes. Um, that's sort of historically kind of how they have been utilized. Um, so when used as like an individual clinical tool, they may not fully capture the unique experiences or needs of each patient. Um, and again, as Dr. Boswell said, uh, this is especially true for individuals who hold marginalized identities um, as they're typically underrepresented or not represented at all in the development and validation studies um, for these tools. Um, so ultimately leading to them being less uh, inclusive and relevant to the diverse experiences of all patients. Um, and then that can lead to a number of specific limitations in using PROMS in, in clinical practice. Um, so they may either overestimate or underestimate patient symptoms. So that can lead to patients feeling uh, pressured to identify issues that aren't really a priority uh, for them because on this scale, they happen to you know, seem to have a, a high score um, or uh, conversely minimize the severity of patient symptoms because again, their score may appear low on this particular scale. Um, certainly can, um, and we, some of you have had this experience, inhibit patient-clinician interaction. So depending on how they're used, um, patients may perceive these assessments as impersonal, um, leading to feelings that uh, clinicians are focusing more on numbers and not on uh, them as a person or on their individual needs. Um, reliance on PROMS uh, alone, and, and especially just on scores and numbers, can create a disconnect in the therapeutic relationship and um, undermine patient-centered care. Um, next problems may not provide specific uh, meaningful information uh, that is critical for effective treatment planning. Um, so especially with, with these tools, you're often summing or averaging scores, and that may feel less informative than uh, some of these individual item responses that are similar to some of the, the items that Dr. Boswell was mentioning. Um, there also may be items, as she was pointing out, that may feel unclear or may feel irrelevant or have different meaning for folks. And if, if you're just aggregating these scores together in some way, you may lose some of that um, information. Um, and then finally, it's important to note that uh, certain PROMs, or in some cases, um, PROMs in general, may not be the most suitable way of uh, assessing a patient's concerns. So their utility can vary substantially based on patient circumstances. So having discussed the benefits and limitations of PROMS um, in general, I wanna focus on um, the eating disorder examination questionnaire, um, which is uh, frequently used in eating disorder research and treatment settings. 
Uh, so the eating disorder examination questionnaire or EDEQ is a 28 item four factor self-report measure. Um, so it's sort of designed to coincide with the EDE interview. Um, th they do share similarities as you'll see in terms of their structure, um, but it's important to note that they should not just be used interchangeably. They do have their differences. They have their, uh, their own strengths and limitations. Um, for instance, um, there's been some research indicating that individuals tend to score higher on some uh, elements of the EDEQ compared to the interview, um, which could be for a number of reasons, but uh, you know, there's some thought that uh, people may feel more comfortable disclosing some sensitive information through self-report measures. Um, there's been some research on that uh, outside of these particular measures, just comparing interview and self-report um, in general. Um, but as Dr. Boswell mentioned, with the interview, you also have the oppor opportunity to prompt and follow up and provide more context, uh, typically, than you would with a self-report measure. Um, and the EDEQ is a widely utilized tool, um, as I said, in both research and clinical settings, um, perhaps in, in part because it's freely available for non-commercial use, making it an attractive option. Um, although more recently, as I'll share in more detail momentarily, um, the psychometric properties uh, have been called into question. Um, the measure has um, previously been lauded as a reliable, valid measure for assessing core features associated with eating disorders. Um, and so as such, it's often endorsed as one of the recommended measures for use with eating disorder patients. Um, I won't spend too much time on this because this should look familiar. <laughs> um, uh, the structure of the EDEQ uh, follows the same structure as the EDE uh, uh, interview. So you'll see that from this measure, you can derive um, a global score. And that global score is comprised of these subscale scores, um, which again, uh, Dr. Boswell talked about these four different subscales and kind of what they're comprised of. Um, and then additionally, with the EDEQ, there are also these behavioral frequency items um, across binge eating, vomiting, laxative use, and compulsive exercise. Um, and uh, compared to the subscale scores, which people are rating um, their uh, symptoms on a zero to six multiple choice response scale, the frequency items are open-ended. So they're just reporting how frequently they have experienced these symptoms. Um, so I'm going to focus primarily on the subscales and the global scores of the EDEQ. Uh, these are the components most frequently used in uh, and reported in assessment and treatment context, and also those where most of the research examining issues related to lack of inclusivity has focused. Uh, so as we discussed earlier, there's been increasing recognition um, that the swag and similar stereotypes surrounding eating disorders are not accurate. Um, and correspondingly, there's been a surge of research, uh, research um, in recent years investigating the potential limitations of measures like the EDEQ in eating disorder assessment. Uh, still more work to be done, but glad to see that there's, there's progress being made. Um, the body of literature on the EDEQ specifically has highlighted uh, several categories of issues um, concerning its uh, uh, relevance for diverse populations. Um, so first is measure accuracy. This is a critical concern, um, encompasses um, elements like construct validity, configural invariance, Dr. Boswell mentioned invariance, measurement invariance previously, and factor structure. And so findings from these studies have called into question whether the EDEQ accurately reflects the constructs it aims to measure across diverse populations. Um, next is equivalence across groups, um, which includes additional uh, aspects of measurement invariance and also things like differential item functioning. Um, studies have indicated that the EDEQ may not perform consistently across various demographic groups, so thereby making it um, producing less equitable and meaningful results. Um, and lastly is uh, appropriate standards, um, and Dr. Boswell uh, highlighted this as well. So this in involves things like norms and cutoffs that are used to interpret scores on the EDEQ. Um, and there's evidence here that existing norms and cut points may not be applicable um, in the same way to all populations. So again, leading to potential misinterpretations of the severity of eating disorder symptoms, for example. Uh, so over the next few slides, I'll review some key findings from studies across these areas, um, specifically foc focusing as we have been on racial and ethnic identity, gender identity, and weight status. 
Um, so I'll try to emphasize just some general takeaways and implications based on these findings. Um, I won't go too deep into the specifics of the study methodology and analyses. Um, for those of you who are, are uh, you know, fellow data and statistics lovers, we have a very comprehensive reference list at the end, um, and we encourage you to, you know, really dive into those um, studies. And there's there's more beyond these as well to kind of learn more about the specifics of um, these studies and this measure and what what has been found. Um, so for measure accuracy um, with the EDEQ. Um, so again, this encompasses um, concepts like construct validity, factor structure, uh, configural invariance. It's okay if you don't know what those mean. <laughs> um, basically together, um, this is referring to whether the test accurately measures what it's supposed to, how the items fit together, and whether its structure, right, in terms of like those subscales, um, is consistent across different groups. Um, I do want to point out that concerns about the EDEQ's validity and factor structure are not limited to specific marginalized populations. Um, the EDEQ's original structure was developed based on uh, clinical insights rather than empirical evidence. Um, and most studies across all populations have struggled to replicate that four factor structure. Um, so this suggests ultimately that um, there are potentially some issues with the original version of the EDQ and the way that we tend to utilize it um, that may need to be considered for all of our patients, not just for those from, some, some, from certain groups. Um, that being said, there is research that has highlighted unique issues um, for specific groups um, that are relevant to this, this presentation. So in terms of racial and ethnic identity, um, there was a study using multi-group confirmatory factor analyses. Um, and basically what the researchers discovered was that um, there was a revised four-factor structure that actually provided a better fit to the data um, in this sample that included Asian, Hawaiian, um, Pacific Islander, and Black, um, in this case, undergraduate men. Um, and so you'll see those revised factors here. So the original subscales that separate weight and shape concern into two distinct constructs uh, did not emerge in this sample. And thus, you know, perhaps are not relevant in that way, in that segmented way with these populations. Um, so instead, this revised model had overvaluation of shape and weight as one factor uh, collectively, and then a separate factor um, of uh, appearance concern. And you'll see some items here uh, that are sort of representative of what those factors are, are really looking at. Um, notably, the authors um, of this study described just in general encountering significant challenges in identifying a good fitting model. I can't remember offhand how many models they ran, but it was quite a lot. <laughs> um, and this was the best fit, but um, ultimately they talked about this suggesting that for the EDEQ to be most useful with these populations and perhaps others, it may need to, to be further adapted, um, not just you know, sort of revising the structure of the existing items. Uh, they also talked about how these findings point to the importance of continuing to develop new measures, right, that capture specific identity salient uh, constructs um, or creating more comprehensive measures that include additional constructs within them that are implicated in eating pathology uh, beyond those of the EDEQ. And I'll return to that um, idea a little bit later. Um, with respect to gender identity, um, there's a study that found that a brief seven item, uh, three factor model of the EDEQ was the best fit for a, gender a sample of gender minority adults. Um, interestingly, this reduced model excluded a number of items from that full EDEQ um, that, that are perhaps culturally incongruent or invalid um, for these groups or have a different meaning. And again, um, this is similar to something that Dr. Boswell mentioned. So these items in particular, um, assessing discomfort with seeing one's own body um, or discomfort with others seeing one's body um, were not included in this final model that was a, a better fit for this population. Um, and so the authors uh, posited that these items may have a different meaning for a gender minority individuals. So due to experiences of gender dysphoria, so they may not coalesce with other eating disorder symptom items on the scale. Uh, for weight status, um, there's a study revealing um, no association between the EDEQ, EDEQ global score 
um, and restraint as reported on uh, daily pre and post meal items for adults um, who had higher weight. Um, the results did show an association with the restraint subscale, but often folks are relying on the global score alone um, as sort of a quick, easy metric. So this suggests that important information regarding um, restraint in daily life may be overlooked when we're just looking at that global score um, as an indicator alone. Um, and then finally, while most studies, again, have focused on identities in isolation, there is some emerging uh, work and evidence indicating that considering uh, intersectionality is, is crucial for understanding the EDEQ's applicability. Um, for example, there was a, a recent study that found um, that the original EDEQ model did not fit well for a sample of Latino um, and Latina undergraduate students. Um, and furthermore, when they looked um, further at the data, they observed an interaction of gender by eth ethnicity on the shape concern subscale in particular. So basically found that um, ethnicity had a larger effect on these scores for men compared to women. Um, so looking at that intersection. Um, so collectively, these findings highlight issues with, again, the accuracy of the EDEQ, including its global score and component subscales in truly capturing the complexities of eating disorder pathology across diverse identities and their intersections. Um, in terms of equivalence across groups, or, or perhaps in this case, non-equivalence across groups, um, as it applies to the EDEQ, um, this refers to whether the test performs equally well for different groups and whether any items are uh, biased or perform differently based on group membership. Um, so we see an example of this uh, potential non-equivalence related to racial and ethnic identity. Um, in this study, they found evidence of what's called metric non-invariance um, between Hispanic uh, white and Hispanic undergraduate women. So this just means that the two groups did not seem to interpret um, or rate the importance of all factors on the same scale. So meaning that their scores really shouldn't be or can't be fairly compared to one another. Um, and specifically um, in this study, uh, Hispanic women showed lower loadings on this dietary restraint item. Um, and the author has suggested that this difference might reflect uh, distinct cultural motivations behind dietary restraint um, based on some prior research showing that Hispanic women may be less likely to report this behavior um, or when they do, it may be driven by other factors, um, more so the need for control rather than desire to alter weight and shape. So again, perhaps this item has sort of different um, uh, relevance for people. Uh, similarly for gender identity, um, a study found um, scalar non-invariance, which means that groups did not report similar baseline ratings. Um, so thus differences may not reflect true differences, but rather just one group tending to rate everything higher or lower. Um, and in this study specifically, women had higher ratings for a number of items um, that you'll see here around um, desire to have a flat stomach. And again, that question about fear of weight gain. Um, and these differences may indicate differing ideals around uh, body type, which again has been supported in prior research looking at gender and um, drive for thinness versus drive for muscularity. Um, and uh, with men tending to uh, focus less on uh, low weight as sort of the, the goal. Um, and then lastly, in terms of weight status, um, this has also um, been shown to influence uh, responses on the EDEQ. Um, in one particular study, they found evidence of uh, what's called differential item functioning, meaning the items demonstrate bias based on group membership. So there was a positive association between um, BMI in this case and scores on the weight and shape concern items. Um, and the author suggested that um, individuals with a higher BMI or higher weight may respond differently to these items. Um, likely, you know, due to the impact of weight stigma on their concerns around body weight and shape. So really kind of capturing something different. So these findings indicate that the EDEQ may not function equivalent, equivalently across diverse groups. So respondents are interpreting questions and response options through their own personal context. Um, last category is appropriate norms and standards. Um, so 
when using the EDQ. So this involves understanding how cutoffs and different benchmarks might need to be adjusted um, for different groups to ensure accurate interpretation of scores. So starting again with racial ethnic um, identity, there was a study that found that um, clinically elevated EDEQ scores, um, in this case uh, above, uh, or scores of four or above, were less predictive of um, other measures of disordered eating. So in particular, looking at episodes of, you know, binging and purging kinds of behaviors in black women than in white women. Uh, so this suggests that um, EDEQ cutoffs may not be the best indicator of clinically significant behaviors uh, for black women and perhaps other groups. Um, in this case, the authors were suggesting that this may be because it doesn't account for additional factors like acculturative stress or experiences of racism, which could play um, a central role in eating disorder pathology for this group, but aren't really accounted for um, in the EDEQ. Uh, in terms of gender identity, uh, a study found that the cutoff for clinically significant symptoms um, was lower uh, for a sample of males, around 1.68, compared to prior cutoffs identified for females, which tended to fall between two and three. Um, so this could uh, suggest, uh, this lower threshold could indicate either a true gender difference in le levels of eating pathology or reflect the fact that the EDEQ was designed um, really focused on the types of symptomatology that fits that swag stereotype. So that is more commonly found in um, girls and women, such as thinness oriented behaviors, rather than perhaps more muscularity um, oriented concerns. Um, and then for weight status um, in this study, they observed that individuals with higher weight, um, in this case, they used um, BMI 30 or, or higher, um, had global EDEQ scores about two to three times higher uh, than those in the BMI defined quote unquote normal weight range within a community sample of women. Um, so specifically these elevated scores were driven by again, greater shape and weight concerns among those with higher weight, which again seems to point to um, experiences of weight stigma uh, exacerbating that. Um, and then the authors indicate that this discrepancy is, is really critical to consider when setting clinical thresholds around things like defining recovery. Um, and then finally, um, while again, the research on intersecting identities is limited, um, there's a recent study that showed um, that EDEQ norms were generally higher for individuals with underrepresented identities and intersections um, within a community sample. And they compared this to existing norms that were being reported and, and used in the literature. Um, so taken together, these differences emphasize the need for careful consideration of norms and standards for diverse groups, as these existing benchmarks may not accurately reflect their experiences. Um, so despite the issues um, we've discussed, uh, the EDEQ remains one of the most commonly used tools for eating disorder assessment. Perhaps you're asking yourself why, <laughs> given all of these identified problems. Um, so there are some challenges that people face and that maybe resonate with, with some of you here today uh, to moving away from the EDEQ. And this is not limited to the EDEQ or the EDE. There are certainly other measures that um, we, you know, we kind of see these same sort of sorts of issues play out. Um, so this is not meant to um, suggest that we simply accept these issues or continue to use the EDEQ as a status quo indefinitely but rather to try to recognize the practical barriers that complicate any sort of transition um, and to then try to understand them so we can identify the most effective best steps. So both in terms of continuing to try to reduce harm within our existing systems, as well as working towards broader uh, systemic change. Uh, so first familiarity and expectations may be relevant uh, factors impacting EDEQ EDEQ usage. So it's well known, it's often expected by different stakeholders like insurance payers, accrediting bodies, funders, etc. Um, so it's established presence makes it a convenient and predictable choice. Um, many organizations have built their benchmarks and protocols around it. Uh, similarly, it's um, often embedded in systems and processes. And so that makes it difficult for, for folks to uh, make a change. Many treatment programs have the EDEQ integrated into their protocols. Um, so especially if you work for a larger organization, um, that it may be difficult to make that kind of shift. 
Um, it's also already built into some existing electronic health record or measurement feedback systems. So that really uh, sort of allows for easy access and streamlined use in ways that, um, you know, utilizing other measures, uh, it's not possible. Um, changing assessment tools would require um, substantial time and investment then um, to update those workflows, modify existing technologies. So if nothing else, it will take time to make those kinds of changes. Um, another potential issue has to do with aggregation and uh, comparison or comparability of data. So because the EDEQ has been used for so long and so widely, um, it's resulted in extensive data collection. So that then facilitates comparisons over time across clinical settings, among research studies, um, and then that historical data can be used for quality improvement and research efforts. Um, so moving to a new tool would mean losing at least that historical data. And ultimately, unless sort of everyone agrees to move to something new, it also makes it difficult for us to continue to aggregate data together or um, you know, make any sorts of comparisons in research and, and other settings. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, the lack of adequate alternatives is a critical barrier. Um, so well-validated, easy to administer alternatives with established norms and standards, especially for diverse clinical populations, don't exist to my knowledge. If anyone <laughs> knows of something um, else, please feel free to share. Um, but many alternative tools also still lack the necessary validation across diverse groups. Um, and without available standards, it can be difficult to interpret those scores consistently, especially in a clinical context. So until better, more inclusive tools become available, the EDEQ may remain a go-to option, even with these limitations. So certainly there's a need for more research um, to develop those tools um, and also work to be done to start trying to shift and address some of these other barriers that are mentioned here as well. So then what do we do? <laughs> Given that, again, that is change that will uh, certainly take time and, and work that needs to be done, but won't happen overnight. Um, it's a gradual process. So in the interim, um, there are steps that we can try to take to minimize harm um, you know, while the EDEQ may remain in use. And again, this may apply to other measures, not just the EDEQ. Um, so these are just some practical recommendations for continuing to use the EDEQ uh, thoughtfully and responsibly. Um, this first point uh, calls back to Dr. Boswell's earlier emphasis on acknowledging the limitations of measures, um, being transparent, and really engaging in open dialogue about the shortcomings of these measures, and inviting uh, patients to share their experiences and provide feedback and talk about um, their interpretations and you know what these uh, questions and, and terms mean to them. Uh, so again, especially within a measurement-based care framework, uh, this kind of collaboration and discussion and talking about the measures and talking about the items and the scores and what they mean for someone and exploring that, that's an expected part of that process. Um, so utilizing that kind of framework when using PROMS can really, um, like the EDEQ, can really um, uh, help mitigate some of that, that potential harm at least. Um, additionally, um, uh, including complementary measures. Again, you know, I, I'm not aware of, of any uh, overall sort of superior uh, measures, um, but combining uh, additional complementary measures um, that uh, maybe capture uh, concerns that aren't addressed by the EDEQ. So kind of calling back to some things that we noticed in the research, uh, maybe muscularity concerns or issues related to gender dysphoria so that you can create overall a more comprehensive and inclusive assessment. Um, and then similarly, to gain a more holistic understanding of patients' experiences, uh, gathering multiple sources of, of data beyond patient report outcome measures, right? So having interviews, especially more semi-structured or unstructured interviews, um, where you can gather additional information. Um, and this aligns with general recommendations for working with diver diverse populations with eating disorders, which really highlight the importance of understanding patients within their personal context. Um, so really applying those general recommendations here. So including trying to understand a patient's worldview, the meaning they attach to their behaviors, 
relevant cultural norms um, and nuances that affect their clinical uh, presentation. Um, and lastly, the EDQ can be used to monitor a patient's progress or difficulties by examining their scores and item responses over time intrapersonally. So rather than comparing these scores to standardized norms, um, really just focusing on the individual patient's um, change over time. So this can allow clinicians to assess how a patient is evolving based on their own previous responses um, and might even include, you know, working with the patient to identify Maybe it's not the global score or the subscale scores, but maybe it's focusing on certain items that you want to look at together over time and see how things are, are changing. Um, overall, um, this is not, again, not, a, not an exhaustive list of recommendations, but just some guidance for using the EDEQ with intentionality, um, trying to minimize harm while still striving for a more um, inclusive assessment process overall. Um, there may be uh, cases or situations that folks are in where there's uh, more flexibility um, to uh, adapt the EDEQ beyond its original format and structure. So these are just a few straightforward modifications that can help make the tool perhaps more inclusive and responsive to diverse patient experiences. Um, so the first one is um, allowing item skipping which may or may not be possible depending on the system that you're working in. Um, if you're working with a measurement feedback system, for example, that has all the items set to be required, you may not have the ability to um, allow that. But if you have the ability to, to do so, um, you can allow patients to skip items that they find triggering or that don't feel relevant to them, thus making the assessment process perhaps less distressing and the scores more personalized. Um, if you're not aware, the EDEQ scoring guidelines indicate that the measure can be scored as long as 50% of the items are completed. So it just requires calculating the scores based on the number of items actually completed as opposed to the number of items on the scale. Um, second, using modified cutoffs or norms when available um, to perhaps better reflect the specific population being assessed. Um, so this may require searching through existing literature. We have some of it um, included here in our reference list and compiling a list of norms and standards for various groups and then using those when appropriate. Of course, the challenge here, as we've, we've mentioned previously, is that there really just hasn't been enough work done um, to date to establish these types of reference points, um, especially for clinical populations um, or for just the variety of intersecting identities and backgrounds that patients may bring to the table. So... Um, you may not find what you need, I guess, for your particular patient. Um, and then lastly, as was alluded to uh, earlier when I was reviewing the research on identified issues with the EDEQ, there are some shorter versions um, that maintain the core of what the EDEQ aims to assess, but has um, fewer items, often excludes some of the more problematic items, and ultimately has better psychometric properties um, than the original version. Um, and these are just a few of those short versions here. There are um, others as well. Um, but just to give a couple of examples, um, the EDEQS um, is uh, 12 items. Um, and uh, you can derive these five factors. Um, although typically um, what has been used most frequently with this is just the overall score. So a lot of folks are using this as a single factor. It's user-friendly, more efficient, quicker to complete um, tool than the larger um, original EDEQ. Um, just a couple of things to note um, with this particular version, uh, they did change the response range from zero to three instead of zero to six. Um, the scores are summed rather than averaged and it does use a different time frame. So it looks at just the prior seven days rather than 28 days. So it does preclude any you know, true comparisons with scores from the original EDEQ. Um, but again, it's a tool that I know a lot of folks are using as a weekly assessment of treatment progress and kind of a quick way of doing that. Um, and there's more work that needs to be done on that measure, but um, there's uh, some studies showing promise in terms of the psychometric properties across different groups. Uh, the version that has shown the strongest potential in the literature is the EDEQ-7, which is just seven items. Um, and uh, breaks down into these three empirically derived factors. Um, and this version has garnered the strongest and most consistent support thus far in clinical samples and among diverse populations and is with seven items um, even quicker to administer. 
Um, one identified disadvantage of the EDEQ-7 is that it does not include the frequency items of the original EDEQ. Um, and so the EDEQ-13 addresses this issue. So it builds on the EDEQ-7 uh, by not only incorporating those items, but actually recoding them so that they include response categories uh, similar to the other items so that subscale scores can be calculated. So this version then has these five subscales or five factors, including binging and purging, so making it a bit more comprehensive. Um, so far, there's been limited research on this measure. Um, so more work needs to be done to really fully evaluate its validity. And I know we've just got a couple minutes left. I see Jamie jumping back on. I just want to quickly mention here as we wrap up, uh, just because I alluded to it previously, but I won't go into um, any detail. Um, you know, again, there aren't any, to my knowledge, um, superior, uh, perfect tools out there, but there are certainly additional tools that could be considered. And you'll see some examples of those here, additional interviews that um, assess uh, cultural aspects of symptomatology um, that can be used with eating disorder assessment. Um, and then both uh, comprehensive as well as more focused eating disorder symptom and body image uh, scales that, um, again, could sort of help with uh, this uh, working towards inclusive uh, assessment. And we've got our key takeaways here that we uh, hope we were able to cover um, that you take away from this uh, presentation today. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Shepard and Dr. Boswell. We actually have two questions in the chat. The first question says, would you please tell us a few words about atypical anorexia? What symptoms does it involve? Thank you in advance. Sure, Dr. Baswell, I don't know if you wanna jump in or I'm happy to as well. Sure, so I can say a few words and if I miss something, Dr. Shepard, feel free to, to fill it in. So atypical anorexia is not in the DSM as a standard diagnostic category for eating disorders, but it's a growing uh, like clinical consensus that there are many folks that don't meet standard weight-related criteria that show all the behavioral and cognitive symptoms that are consistent with anorexia nervosa. And oftentimes those folks um, may not meet body size related criteria, but do exhibit perhaps equal, if not greater, uh, medical and psychiatric risk than folks that are in that anorexia nervosa category firmly. Yes, I think that pretty much sums, sums it up. Um, I, I know I was reading a couple of different studies recently, and essentially the work seems to be suggesting that these are not distinct uh, disorders, mm -hmm. that it's really just the weight criterion, which, you know, is coming from, from this weight bias, um, that is being used to distinguish them. And as sort of similar to some of what we saw in this research that as Dr. Boswell mentioned, in some cases, um, with that population, we see, um, higher levels of symptomatology, you know, perhaps again, to experiences of weight stigma and, and discrimination. And our final question do they usually use EDEQ and EAT26 together or EDEQ is more preferable? What would you suggest? Is there a risk to overload a patient with questionnaires? Yes, <laughs> I'll yeah. answer that last part. Yes, there is definitely a risk that, to that. Um, it's always a, a struggle, you know, clinically. We also struggle with this in research, you know, where you want to get all of this information and as much information as possible, but we also know, you know, the more that you're asking people to answer these questions, um, the less valid, useful information you may ultimately get. So it may be overwhelming. And so trying to sort of balance getting what you really need and having some comprehensive assessment is, is difficult. I guess and as far as the first part of the question with the, uh, EAT uh, versus the EDEQ, I think people certainly may use those together, but more often than not, I think people are choosing an eating disorder symptom specific measure. And then as we talked about um, complementing that or supplementing that with other measures that may be useful, that give you sort of a more holistic picture of the individual, things that are not accounted for by the EDEQ, since there is a fair amount of overlap, especially between those two particular measures. Yeah, I would say the same, that those two measures tend to overlap and the assessments that Dr. Shepard mentioned that 
uh, highlight more nuanced understandings of body image across groups might be more, uh, more apt compliments. Thank you both. And lastly, we'll end with a wonderful compliment from Ronnie Lee. No question, just wanting to praise the work you all are doing to highlight the importance of inclusivity when administering assessments. Thank you. And well, that, thank you. <laughs> that will call it for this presentation. Thank you all so much. Thank you for joining us. And I hope that you will stay and join us for our next session, which is going to be on the role of podcasting and advocacy in eating disorder recovery. So thank you so much and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.